Anyway, um, so Mr. Tan King Lin has given you a broad overview of the tax structure in Singapore and he has also asked the question whether the system is fair. So I think we will touch a bit more about this uh, in this presentation. So um, Mr. Leung, Mr. and I have written a pamphlet <coughs> on how much tax Singaporeans are paying. So I'm going to give you an overview of that and then I will go into a bit of the budgetary issues in Singapore. Okay? So um, for the start, I'm going to look at a comparative perspective uh, with uh, Sweden and Finland. Uh, we look at Sweden and Finland because they are the countries which pay the highest tax and Singapore is known as the country which pays the, the lowest tax among the high income countries. So we'll look at that and also because the um, high uh, Sweden and Finland, the Nordic countries, they are also the happiest countries, most innovative, most productive. So let's compare Singapore with them. Okay? Um, if you look at personal income tax, it has always been known that Singaporeans pay a low personal income tax, right? We pay 10% out of the total proportion of GDP. Uh, sorry, uh, total amount of um, uh, government revenue. Okay, so um, and then if you look at Finland and Sweden, they pay 34 and 40 percent respectively. So in comparison, it looks quite low, right? Now the thing is, uh, when you look at when you compare with indirect tax, Singaporeans actually pay 3.5 times more into indirect tax, whereas for Finland and Sweden, they only pay one time more into indirect tax. So we're paying a lot more tax in a sense. Okay, and then if you look at Social Security or CPF, we actually pay three times more into CPF. Whereas in Finland and Sweden, they only pay one time more and 0.5 times more in Finland and Sweden respectively. So again, we are paying a lot more into CPF. Uh, there might be a question about whether CPF is our money, so uh, well, I'll touch a bit on it later, okay? <laughs> because it's not our money. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'm going to touch on it. Anyway, <laughs> okay. so if you add it all up, if you look at how much Singaporeans are paying into tax, personal income tax, indirect tax, and social security CPF, we're actually paying 86% into um, um, tax and CPF out of government revenue. Whereas if you compare with Finland and Sweden, they pay 94 and 97% respectively. So actually when you look at it, it's not very different. Singaporeans don't pay low taxes at all. Okay. Um, okay. Why, why is the issue of low tax important? The issue of low tax is important because we then need to put social protection into perspective. The government is spending money back to us for transport, healthcare, etc. But are they spending enough? So this is the backdrop for that. Okay? Um, for personal... <clears throat> the other thing I want to touch on is on personal income. Uh, so we pay tax and social CPF. But the other thing that we also need to pay is out-of-pocket expenditure. The out-of-pocket expenditure that we've calculated is about one time more than what we pay to uh, personal income tax and CPF. Okay? But when you look at Finland and Sweden, they don't actually have to pay anything else. They pay next to nothing for healthcare, for education, etc. Okay? So that means that if you add up, Singaporeans actually pay another time more uh, on top of CPF and uh, personal income tax, if you include out-of-pocket expenditure. Okay? Maybe I'll give you the per capita figures, it will be a bit clearer. Okay. We've calculated that um, this is out of the resident population of each country. So if you look at personal income tax, Singaporeans pay per capita 2000 into personal income tax, whereas in Finland and Sweden, they pay about 10000 and 15000 per capita into personal income tax. Then if you look at CPF, Singaporeans pay three times more, so that's 6000 And in Finland and Sweden, they pay 7000 and 6000 per capita. So actually when you look at it, it's not very different when you look at CPF. Okay? We'll, add up, we'll add up more. So when you add up personal income tax and CPF, we actually pay 8,000 in total. And then uh, in Finland and Sweden, this is 17,000 and 21,000. Okay, and when you add in out of pocket expenditure, which I say is about one time more than what we pay to personal income tax and CPF, right? So that's 8,000 again. So if you add up how much we actually have to pay out of pocket, oh, okay, so Finland and Sweden, they don't have to pay um, anything else more. Uh, so if you add up how much we pay out of pocket into, and then with personal income tax and CPF, we actually pay 16,000. And if you compare with Finland and Sweden, they pay 17,000 and 21,000 per capita, which means that we are not paying that much different from them. Um, I think the question that we have to ask too is, because right now Singaporeans have to pay out of pocket for healthcare, for education, uh, for the Finland, uh, for the Nordic countries, they pay everything into tax and CPF, uh, social security, but they get back in return uh, free healthcare, free education, etc. Now in Singapore, uh, it's estimated that perhaps 40% of Singaporeans are not able to buy um, health, uh, private health care insurance, which means they fall out of the system. The thing in Singapore is that it's very unequal because there's very low taxes, the rest of the money comes out from our own pocket. But because a lot of the poor and the low income and the lower middle income, they cannot afford, so they fall out of the system. So the question we have to ask is, do we want a system where the government consolidates the money, a responsible 
government consolidates the money and redistributes it so that even the low income, middle income and high income can also benefit. In the in these Nordic countries, how they work is regardless of your income level, you do get a subsidy that is fair and um, that that is uh, affordable for you in a sense. So the question now is, should we want a system that's more equal or a system that's, that's so unequal that the low income and the low middle income fall out? Okay. Can I? Can I? Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, the next thing I'm going to look at is how much the government pays back to us in social protection. In Singapore, the government gives back in social protection $10,000 per capita. Okay, in Finland and Sweden, the government gives back $24,000 and $28,000 per capita. Okay, and if we add it indirect tax into what we pay, so personal income tax, CPF, out of pocket, plus indirect tax, we pay about $22,000. And in Finland and Sweden, they pay $27,000 and $36,000. Per capita. So if you look at how much the government gives back in social protection as a proportion of that, the government only gives back 43% in Singapore. But in Finland and Sweden, the government gives back 89% and 79% respectively, which is a lot higher. Okay. So if the government is spending as much as what the Nordic countries is spending, they should be giving back about $18,000. So that's about twice as much. Which, What this means is that there's actually a loss of expenditure of about $8,000, which the government is not giving back. Okay, if you compare with the uh, Nordic countries. Okay, so um, I want to move into talk, uh, talking about wages. The, we need to look at how much we pay in taxes in perspective. So we pay as much, almost as much as the Nordic countries into tax and CPF and social security, right? But if you look at wages, in Singapore, Singaporeans, out of the total GDP, Singaporeans only get 42% of that back into wages. Okay, but in the Nordic countries, the governments, uh, the people will get like sixty percent uh, wage. Okay, which means that Singaporeans get about twenty percentage points lower in terms of what we should get back in wages. For the other, for the other high income countries, they pay um, fifty five to sixty percent into uh, wage wages. While in Singapore, it's only forty two percent. Okay, so when you look at that in perspective, that means that Singaporeans, the median wage is about three thousand. So um, in a year, it's thirty six thousand. Okay, if so in Finland, they earn almost 160 times, 160% more, they earn 56,000 per year. And in Sweden, they earn almost 170% more, they earn 60,000 per year. So now we pay almost the same as what they do in the personal income tax, CPF, out-of-pocket expenditure, but we get a much lower wage. So what that means is that we spend 65% of our wage paying for all these things. Whereas in Finland, they only need to pay 47%, and in Sweden, they only need to pay 59%. And so we pay the highest proportion, and we have the lowest. The, the purple bar is how much we have left. Even if you just look at the purple bar as compared to this proportion, you can see that our purchasing power is very, very low. Because we are paying almost the same, but because our wages are so low, our purchasing power is also very low. Uh, a study done by UBS in 2011 ranked Singapore as having the lowest purchasing power, which is almost the same as Kuala Lumpur, which is actually, but we are four times more uh, richer than them by GDP per capita, yet we have the same purchasing power. So that's, that's very bad. Okay. So the ne next question uh, we have to ask is, are Singaporeans being treated fairly? Okay. In terms of wages, let's look at it. So if you look at, this is a yellow box, you can't see, but it's the whole of the total income in Singapore. So if you look at how much the richest 1% earns, the richest 1% actually earns as much as the poorest 40% in Singapore. Okay. This is uh, a bit also, actually the divide is even further now. Okay. And if you look at how much the richest 5% earn, oh by the way, for the richest 1%, the medium, the real medium income is $2.1 million. So you can kind of guess who's in the zero, top 0.1% 0 in Singapore. Okay. Um, then for the richest 5%, they earn as much as the poorest 60% in Singapore. And for the richest 5%, they earn about $15,000 and above. Okay, so you can also kind of guess who's in the richest 5%. Okay, and then for the richest 20%, they earn as much as the poorest 80% in Singapore. So that means the divide is quite big. The poorest 80% actually takes about 50% of the income, whereas the richest 20% takes the, the other 50%. It's, the divide is... What the problem is in Singapore is even though our median wage is the lowest, the, for the high income earners, they actually earn the highest wages in Singapore, and the low income earners earn the lowest wages in Singapore. The divide, the disparity is the widest in Singapore as compared to all the other high income countries. Okay. Um, so that is why income inequality, like Mr. Tankini has said, is highest in Singapore as compared to all the high income countries. 
And also poverty rate, as we've calculated at 26%, is also much higher than all the other countries. Poverty rate in this instance is half of the medium wage. Half, medium wage is about six, uh, 3,000 now, so half of it is anyone who earns below 1,500 is living in poverty. Okay, so that's 26%. Um, I will take a look at the specific uh, wage that each people are earning. So these are three Singaporeans. The low income earner earns about eight hundred dollars per month. The medium income earner earns three thousand, and the high income earner earns about fifteen thousand. Okay. And then uh, in the middle, the low income earner would nine, earn nine thousand six hundred. The middle income thirty six thousand, and the high income earner one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Okay. So we calculated how much they need to spend for the basic necessities. So for tax. Singaporeans, the highest income earner pays about 20%. Uh, Singaporeans pay about 36% into CPF, uh, employer, employer 16% and employee 20%. Okay? Uh, for food, we estimate that a person spends $15 per day, transport about $100 per month, housing about $600 per month for a uh, um, four-room flat. Uh, healthcare, we estimate about $1,000, and education $2,000 for two school-going children in university and polytechnic. It's actually a lot higher, but we put in a low estimate. Okay? Um, so, um, this is how much they pay in a year, 20% to tax for the highest income earner. By the way, um, there's no discrimination for uh, high income earners and low income earners, etc. I'm pointing out the specific scenario in Singapore, so there's no... Um, there, there shouldn't be a distinction, because if the system is fair, regardless of whether you're low income or high income earner, it, it's a fair system for all. Uh, do I make sense? Okay, anyway, we'll go on. So, uh, for CPF... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So uh, for for CPF, the employee CPF is twenty percent. So out of their wage, we just look at it as twenty percent. Okay. How much they get in wages and how much they pay into CPF. Okay. And then for food, they will pay about five thousand four hundred a year, one thousand four hundred a year for transport, seven thousand four hundred a year for housing, and for healthcare and education is one thousand and two thousand. So if you look at how much a low uh, how much a low income earner spends, uh, just to put it into perspective. Uh, tax is zero dollars. Uh, CPF is about one thousand nine hundred twenty dollars. But for food, we put in a lower estimate because they are they are poor, so we put it as three thousand six hundred dollars. Okay. And then for um, housing, we put it as one thousand two hundred dollars because they are renting uh, HDB flats, so that's about hundred dollars per month on on average. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So for the low income earner, they would pay about twenty percent into tax and CPF. For the middle income earner, they will pay about 21% into tax and CPF. And for the high income earner, they will pay about 15% into tax and CPF. So that means that for the low income and the middle income earners, they actually have a much lower purchasing power because they pay out a higher proportion of their wages into tax and CPF. Okay. So how much would they have left? For the low income earner, after, uh, after accounting for all this, they actually go into a debt of more than $1,000. But for the middle income earner, they earn about 11,000, uh, 12,000 a year. Uh, they save about 12,000 a year. And for the high income earner, they save about 1,125,000 a year. Okay. And if you look at, say, that means that for the low income earner, they have to forego some form of expenditure. So for them, they might have to forego education, for example. Okay. Now, if you add in the other, say if the couple has two children, so they have to spend more for another children. They have additional expenses of food and transport. And they might have to buy insurance because the current current let's say the shield does not provide hundred percent expenditure uh, coverage for Singaporeans. You do have to buy private insurance. So we estimate about two thousand four hundred dollars for the middle income and high income earner. Um, okay. So how much would they have to spend? It's about four thousand eight hundred for the low income and nine thousand for the high income and middle income earner. And again, when you look at how much they have to save in total. The low income person actually goes to a debt of more than six thousand, whereas the middle income earner will only be able to save two thousand or three thousand in a year. Okay, that means that for the low income earner, they have to forego education, they have to forego healthcare. So what this means is that possibly about fifty percent or more Singaporeans would never be able to save and retire. Okay. Okay. Um, let me think. I think I'll. Okay, I'll just quickly go through this. So for the middle income earner, I've talked about how the disparity is the widest. In the other countries, the disparity is a lot smaller for the between the income levels. Okay, for the middle income compared to the low income, they earn about four times more. For the high income earners, they earn about 19 times more than the low income. Okay, and if you look at how much they have left in a year, this is how much they have left, and how much they have left in a month. For the high income earner, for the low income earner, they might they won't be able to save at all. But for the high income earner, they actually save more than what a low income earner earns in a year. Okay, and then if you look at additional luxury items, the only um, middle income and low income earner would not be able to um, purchase them, but for the high income earner, they will still be able to 
purchase and have a huge uh, savings left over. I think the point here to make is that the point here to make is that um, the income disparity is wide in Singapore. Do we should we narrow it so that the low income earners can get a high, higher wages, so that the purchasing power across the board is also is, is, uh, uh, rises? Okay. I think the, so. The next question is: What if Singaporeans are paid fairly? If Singaporeans are paid fairly, for the low income earner, instead of earning eight hundred dollars a year. I mean, I estimate that they will earn about 2,800 a year, and for the middle income, they might earn about 6,000. Because for the prices and the cost of living that we have in Singapore, if you look at the comparative, uh, a, com a country which has a similar price level, they earn about twice the uh, medium wage that we do, 6,000. So after you deduct for, so that's the annual expenditure, and after you deduct for the ex um, expenditure, this is the savings that you'll get. So at least for the low income earner, they will now be able to save instead of going to a debt. Okay? And the, low, the middle income earner would also be able to save a lot more. And this is compared to how much they are actually saving at this point. Instead of going to do that, a low income earner will be able to save more. Okay. And then if, you, if they want to buy a luxury item, uh, say a car, even the middle income would be able to purchase a car at this point. And I mean the car might not be a luxury item because for, for families it is a real, uh, it's a real need. Yeah. Okay. So even after you look at the savings that they have, Everyone, everyone in Singapore would be able to save if we are able to ensure that everyone has fair wages, are paid fairly. Okay. Yeah. So the next question you might ask is, some people have asked, so do we have enough money in Singapore? We want to talk about increasing wages, we want to talk about having better social benefits for Singaporeans, but do we have the wages? And do we have the money to do so? And we do. Uh, let's look at healthcare. For Medisafe, there is 60 billion currently inside the Medisafe amount, of which only 768 million is spent in a year, which is only 1.3%. And if you look at the Medishield surplus from 2000, and 2000 to 2010, there's 850 million in the surplus, but only 282 million is spent, or 33%. Okay? And for Medifund, there's 3 billion, um, 3 billion, uh, 3 billion capital, but only 100 million is spent. So this is only 3.2%. And if you add it all up, the total 3M amount that we have is nearly 64 billion, but we are only using 1.2 billion, which is about 1.8%. Okay. So that means that because we're only spending 1. Point, this 1.8% is only 8 point. So out of total health expenditure, Medicaid, 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 only accounts for 8.8%. Okay. Which means that because we have such low expenditure, the total, out of the total government expenditure, the government only spends 30%. Makes sense. Um, in other high income countries, they spend the, the governments will spend 70%. But in Singapore, our government only spends 30%. So if we were to spend as much as what the other high income countries are spending, we should actually, if we spend up to 10% of the whole total 3M amount, we will actually be able to meet that 70% uh, target. And there will still be 90% left in that amount for investments or whatever users. So there is still quite a significant number of money left in the 3M amount. Okay. And then if you look at the total health expenditure, like I say, the total health expenditure is 13.1 billion, out of which only 5.5% is uh, through Medicaid, 2.1% from MediShield, 0.7% from MediFund, and Singaporeans have to spend out of pocket 61.3%, more than 60%, and the government only spends 30%. So as I said, in other countries, the government will spend up to 70 or more percent. Okay, on average it's 70 percent, but in other countries it's about 80 percent. So if you look at how much the government subsidies are, the 4 billion is actually only 6 percent of the whole 3M amount that we have. Okay. Next, we look at CPF. CPF, Singaporeans are only earning 2.5 to 4 percent of our CPF. But it's known that the CPF is invested in the reserves. The reserves are invested by Thomasin Holdings and GIC. So GIC earns 6.5 interest per annum uh, since inception, and Thomasic earns 16% since inception. So now if you look at how much we save uh, after, from, for a person who work, retires at 65, based on for a medium, uh, uh, medium income earner, so someone who earns about 3,000, when he retires with a 2.5 to 4% interest, they might retire with only 700,000 uh, when they retire. But if they are able to get back the, the interest rates that um, the GIC and the Masai are earning, they might get back about 7.5%, which would be about 2.8 million. So this tax that we are not getting back, which is between 3.5% uh, to 5%, is known as the implicit tax, which is not being returned to Singaporeans. So if you, the, I think the next chart you can see is, 
In, our, in the total CPF balance, there is currently 248 billion in our CPF. So this is how, this is how much Singaporeans have contributed, nearly 250 billion. And of which only 11 billion was withdrawn last year. So, I mean, if we, if CPF is really our money, why is there such a huge balance inside the CPF? Okay. And if you look at how much the, our CPF is invested in the reserves, and you look at who is managing the reserves and how much they have, the Monetary Authority of Singapore manages 320 billion, Tomase Holdings manages 215 billion, and GIC manages 360 billion. So, in total, they manage about $1 trillion, of which this of the CPF that we are putting in is helping to earn. So the reserves have a lot of money, but what about Singaporeans and our retirement funds? Where is it going? Okay. Then next, if you look at housing, uh, a very quick example, say some a four room flat is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Mr. Leong Sihin estimate that the um, the um, construction cost is up forty percent, which is hundred thousand. So even with that, the hundred and sixty five thousand that we are paying is actually money that's being made. Because it is known that the land cost costs next to nothing for the Singapore government. Okay, yeah. I think Mr. Bill will further elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll go to education. <coughs> education is, uh, it was recently reviewed a few weeks ago that tuition grants, the government gives 210 million in tuition grants for international students. Okay, and for scholarships, 36 million is given per cohort um, per year. Okay, so for, that's for cohort. If you look at all cohorts, it will be about 144 million in a year. In total, if you add it all up, whatever the government is paying for international students for tuition grants and scholarships would be 400 million dollars. If you look at the 400 million dollars that's given back to Singaporeans, we will all be able to get all the undergraduate Singaporean students will be able to get free education. All pre university students before preschool will be able to get free education, and all preschool children will be able to get free education if you just look at the 400 million dollar amount. So the question is, if the government is willing to spend that much money for international students, should they first consider spending that money on Singaporeans first, and then spending on international students? Okay. Yeah. Now let's look at transport. Um, this is the fair revenue, that's fair and non-fair revenue that's been collected in Singapore. This is the operating expenses. Also, this is the fair and the light purple bar is the fair and non-fair revenue for SMRT and SPS Transit. The dark purple bar are the operating expenses for these two transport companies. You can see that whatever they collect in revenue from us is actually higher than the operating expenses, which means that Singaporeans fully subsidize for their operation, transport operating costs. But if you look at the other high-income countries, the government would actually step in to subsidize perhaps about 50% of the cost. So again, where is the government's um, subsidy here? If you look at if you look at how much oh so how much Singaporeans are paying for fair revenue is about 113 percent 113 percent more than operating expenses. This is known as the fair box recovery ratio. Only Singapore and Hong Kong has such a high ratio. For the other high income countries, it's about 50 percent, which means that the government will step in to foot in the, foot the other 50 percent of the uh, bill. Okay. And then for, if you look at how much profits SMRT and SBS has earned from 2000 to 2013, they've earned more than $2.6 billion. Dollars. So recently, the government announced, a few years ago, they announced that they will give the transport operators $1.1 billion for the buses. But if they have $2.6 billion, why are Singaporeans spending $1.1 billion in addition uh, for that? And even if you see how much the transport operators will spend, if they purchase the buses by themselves, they will still have $1.5 billion left in profits. So that's still a lot of money. And if they, are, if they are public transport operators, should they be earning such high profits? Okay, so um, I think that's pretty much it. What I want to say is that do we have that money? If you look at how much we have in healthcare, transport, how much we are paying for transport, education, we do have that kind of money. It's just a matter of prioritization, whether the government is willing to prioritize the amount of government subsidies that they should be giving back. And we do have that kind of money, so it's about making sure that it's more equitably distributed. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So the question is, are Singaporeans being treated fairly? And then are Singaporeans being taken advantage of? Are we being taken for granted? We are paying all that tax, but first we are not seeing it coming, we are not seeing it come back in terms of social protection, and next we are not seeing it being distributed evenly, and we are also not seeing it distributed as much as the government's responsibility should be. So um, I guess uh, moving on we will talk about the, um, I think Mr. Liu will share further about the stats, and then, then we will talk more about the uh, proposals and the submissions that the other government, uh, the other agencies have.